Just to uh, set the stage a little bit, I'm Jacob Weisberg. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Pushkin Industries, which is a audio production company focused mostly on podcasting, although we also make audio books and do some other interesting, let's say, experimental work in audio. I founded the company with my partner, Malcolm Gladwell, who you can see speak tomorrow. Uh, we founded it in 2018. And the first good decision we made, maybe the only good decision we made, was to call our friend Michael Linton to help us think through things, and Michael is the chairman of our board. So it's kind of unusual to have someone who's kind of running company with the person who is, uh, plays a primary role in advising the company. But part of the reason we did that is because Michael is a wise head about business and, and life in general, but he was also a fan of podcasting, and I think he shared a lot of the enthusiasm that Malcolm and I had that drove us to start the company. Um, so we'll have a pretty open-ended conversation. Um, it, you know, Chris, just there, I think there are, there are, despite what I said at the beginning, a few people here who look like they might be student age. Um, and um, Michael and I have both had kind of varied careers in the media. Michael in the uh, film business, running Sony, TV, book publishing before that. Um, I had a long background in journalism, in magazine journalism in, in particular. And um, we thought there might be some kind of questions about what careers in the media look like, not limited to podcasting. Um, so if anybody wants to talk about that in the Q&A, we can get into that kind of thing as well. Um, but Michael, what, what do you think? Well, <laughs> how about this? Since I feel like slightly the imposter here, because I've never made a podcast, why don't I start by asking you a few questions, and then we can start having a conversation, then opening up to the room. Sounds good. Good. So you had a very long and great career in print journalism, and I'm curious what got you to move over into audio. Why was that something that became interesting to you, and at what point did you do that? Well, I had um, I had made a big move. I had started writing for magazines. I got going at the New Republic, which was a uh, weekly print magazine in the late 80s when I started working there. Uh, and then at the dawn of the internet, uh, someone named Michael Kinsley, who was a great political journalist and who was really my mentor and boss at the New Republic for a long time, uh, got very interested in starting a new, we didn't even call it a digital magazine. We didn't call it digital or a magazine. We thought we might do some version of what we were doing on the internet. And I made that jump in 1996, which was really the beginning of what you know we would now look back on as digital journalism. And that was tremendously exciting for a lot of reasons, but um, I think the reason I made that move then was it was a chance to be involved in inventing a medium or seeing a, a revolution in a medium from the inside. So still practicing journalism, the kind of political journalism, analytical journalism I'd always done, but with a, a new form factor that you know, changed all sorts of things about what you did. And um, what we discovered doing that was that there are all sorts of qualities and aspects to doing journalism on the internet that changed it. And then when I started to get involved in podcasting, which I did when I was running Slate in the uh, mid, or, uh, mid first decade of the 2000s, I started to see the same kind of opportunity again. There was this new medium that was going to be born and the rules weren't set yet. Mm -hmm. And that's such a great period because new media don't emerge that often. I mean, if you look back historically, you know, radio, TV, I mean, mass circulation, newspapers. Um, but there's a period that might last for 10 years or might last a little longer than that when the, the people who are doing it well define the nature of the medium. And then if you come along later, you can work within that medium, it's great. But a lot of rules are set. I mean, the analogy might be to um, TV. Uh, establishing 30 minutes and 60 minutes is format for television programs with regular commercial in interruptions, certain kinds of sponsorships, certain kinds of formats, certain kinds of styles. Um, eventually that all gets set. With podcasting, it's actually still not set. Uh, and that's part of what's exciting about it. A podcast can be five minutes or it can be three hours and there are podcasts of both kinds. And no one of those things is absolutely the right way to do it. And so as a journalist or someone who thinks in editorial terms, there's tremendous opportunity to be inventive about what you're, what you're creating. Hmm. And what sort of, when you, when you look at it and see what was done 
in sort of long-form journalism and then it, as it translates to podcasting, how, what things are similar and what things have really been different about, about it all? And I give you, I give, yeah. I ask, the reason I ask the question is, and, and I don't know whether other people have this sort of, um, have the same reaction, but when I, for example, I listen to an episode of The Daily in the morning, typically those same things are somehow reported in the New York Times. Yep. But it, it and, and occasionally I'll both read the article in the paper and then I'll, or before or after, I'll listen to the podcast. And somehow those two things, while they're covering the same subject and presumably the reporting is done on the same subject, they seem quite different in terms of how they approach the subject. And the people who are most aware of those differences are the people who are my generation, who worked in some other medium and then have come to audio. And that includes among the people we've worked with, Malcolm Gladwell, Michael Lewis, who was on the stage earlier today, um, Jill Lepore, a Harvard historian we worked with. Um, all of these people had never worked in audio. And so I sort of collate a lot of the, the observations they make about it. And one thing they all say very quickly is that the role of emotion is central in audio. And mm. it's not central when you write in print. Um, Malcolm frames this in terms of trying to make people cry. Hmm. I mean, he just puts it that way. He said when he was writing, it was never, never would be a goal to try to make anybody cry. But in, in the podcast, really there's that moment when the listener chokes up because of the, the texture and the feeling of what's being conveyed. And interestingly, working with audio producers and editors, that's a specific thing that they're very often looking for in an interview we interview someone and you then have an hour tape of the interview. I, as an old print journalist, will like, would look at a transcript or, well, first of all, I would look at a transcript, but I would say, what's the news here? What's the thing this subject said that they've never said before? What's the thing that kind of moves the needle? Audio producers and editors think very differently about it. They listen for what's the moment when that person's voice cracks? You know, and this doesn't describe everything that happens in audio, but capturing emotion and conveying emotion seems to be a central part of the experience. Um, I think, you know, another thing that is sort of revelatory is just the fundamental role of the host and the narrator as the bridge to the audience. When you read, you know, most of the journalism I ever wrote, um, most readers aren't really aware who wrote it. They'll say, they'll say, I read a really good article in The New Yorker, and here's what, what it was about. I read this article in the newspaper. Who wrote it? Only journalists really pay attention to the bylines and who the writer is. Uh, in audio, Julia Barton's in the front row. She's nodding. I've learned, Ju Julia's our lead editor at Pushkin, and I've, I have actually learned most of what I know about this from Julia. So apologies for the plagiarism, but at least I'm, credit I'm crediting you. Um, but um, you know, they relate to the material through the person talking to them about the material. And people pick a podcast, not so much based on the subject matter, but based on, on the host, based on the voice, and who's, who they're gonna be having that continuing experience with. Hmm. And you say that podcasting hasn't yet really settled into formats or forms. If I look at other forms of media, you know, you talk about television, television sitcom, 22 minutes, you had the commercials goes to 30. That got set very early, you know, early 50s with the Honeymooners. Drama, similar, 44 minutes, an hour with the commercials, very early. Film, two hours, almost immediately. Why is podcasting still trying to figure out what the form is? It is, is it because in those other medium there were sort of restrictions put on it by the, by the business around it? Or I, it, it's always curious to me that it's still, you know, sometimes I, I listen to a podcast that's an hour and a half long, sometimes it's 30 minutes long. It, it's, it's, it, it doesn't seem to have found a format at this point. For makers, I think that's a strength, not a weakness, that you can let the material and the story dictate the length. Huh. And of course, there is this natural entropy where things get longer if you let them, and you know, we, we at Pushkin, I think, are big believers in a certain kind of efficiency and not wasting the listener's time. And our, you know, our, te our shows tend to be, there's a range, but most of them are like a tight 32 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, and we've di digested this material down. We don't do long, open-ended talk shows for the most part. Even the interview shows we do are very well edited and 
concise. That's our style. And as you say, other people love, and, and probably the most successful shows in podcasting are things like, you know, Joe Rogan that sprawl for hours. And yeah. I, you know, as a consumer don't like, and I as a producer I'm not particularly interested in making. But they're, they're clearly, that's clearly one format that can succeed. On the other hand, there are podcasts that are, you know, short. I mean, the, the Daily, when it started, was, um, was a fairly disciplined 20 minutes. They've, they've, let, they've let the entropy kick yeah, in yeah, a little bit. Longer. But, you know, I love that it was like, and if you listen to it on one and a half speed, as I do, and skip the commercials. Oh, wait, I'm not supposed to say that. But you can listen to the Daily pretty efficiently in about 13 minutes if it's 20 minutes long. Um, but I would kick back to you the question of whether the failure after however many years to settle on those more standardized formats is a strength or a weakness in, in commercial terms because, you know, podcasting is still a relatively small industry. I mean, the value of the entire industry is still below $2 million as compared to, you know, shrinking industry radio, which is still... $15 billion annual industry in the U.S. or, you know, that's not, and even that is very small compared to some, some other um, forms of broadcast and, and digital media. So the question is, do you think that lack of standardization is hampering the growth of podcasts or business? Do you think it ultimately has to happen? I personally, coming from, at it from other forms of media, think it really does hurt the business. I think it hurts the business for a couple of reasons. First of all, you know, one of, the, one of the benefits, whether it's in television to the restrictions or movies or even, you know, I, I've also spent a lot of time in the music business where your average song should never be really longer than three or four minutes. When you put constraints around a creative enterprise, you typically get better things. Mm. You know, if you give unlimited budget and unlimited time to a filmmaker or to a musician, by and large, it's not as good as when you sort of put parameters around it. And by the same token, when you don't allow the audience to understand what they're going to get, you know, if I were to tell an, somebody in the audience, oh, you can turn on a, an episode if I'm going to date myself, Seinfeld, but I can't guarantee you how long it's going to be, the audience typically then backs up and says, well, I don't know how much time I'm going to devote to this, and I'm not sure I want to spend more than my half an hour on it. So I think in, on both sides of the ledger, both from the perspective of somebody making it as well as for somebody consuming it, I do think it does, it, 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 it hampers what, the growth of, of podcasting. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think there is, I, I, would, I, would, I would make a, a distinction between two, you know, pretty closely aligned terms, which are constraint, which I think is a positive in relation to creativity, and standardization or regimentation, which is not necessarily. So to take another analogy, you know, after years of very standardized television formats, HBO comes along mm -hmm. and says, you know, a show doesn't have to be 22 minutes or 44 minutes. It can be the episodes of The Sopranos will be of varying length. Now, they're still roughly an hour. Mm -hmm. You know, some of them might be 47 minutes and some of them might i don't know if they ever actually go over an hour maybe they do on special occasions but because they don't have the you know the the, the uh pure restraint of the hour block they can have that variety and that is one of the things that i think freed up a lot of creative people yep. to say you know we don't we made this beautiful thing that's 59 minutes and we aren't going to destroy it by making it 44 minutes um, so I like the idea of constraint, but mm -hmm. I don't like the idea of pure standardization. Hmm. Okay. Why, why are podcasters obsessed by crime? I mean, like, <laughs> every time I see another podcast, it's about somebody solving some horrible murder somewhere. It's as though it's, it's designed by serial killers. I just don't, <laughs> I, I really don't get it. Yeah, by serial killers, for serial killers. Um, it's very interesting. I mean, one thing is I think early stages of a lot of medium genre of some kind tends to emerge mm -hmm. as the thing that, that works. And uh, crime, I mean, if you go back to something you and I are, have some interest in, you because you ran um, Penguin back when, um, the early days of paperback novels. Yeah. Crime was very, very closely tied to the emergence of paperbacks huh. as, as a format. 
ma and making them available, cheap, accessible, the, the green penguins in right. UK, right. and then a lot of um, paperbacks with those lurid covers, if you ever see those in a used bookstore where the, you know, the killer has the, the blood dripping dagger and the, you know, the, um, the, the bosomy victim. I mean, they're, you know, it's a whole kind of exploitative genre in um, artistic style too. Um, but interestingly, in some more mature media, uh, then that goes away. So in book publishing, true crime, which is the category that's so dominant in podcasting, not crime fiction, but true crime stories, isn't particularly, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the bestseller list, they're not, the yeah, non-fiction bestsellers, they're not, they're not filled with true crime. So why is it? I think it goes um, to this sort of nature of listening and the triggering of the emotions and, you know, a lot of things psychologists could tell you about the, you know, sort of pleasurable experience of, of pain and probably, you know, some unhealthy emotions about um, other people's, you know, other people's pain. Um, I think we started, we started Pushkin, we very high-mindedly said, oh, we're not going to make any of those. Huh. Um, and, you know, that's sort of, and also as a, as a journalist, I mean, I think part of our mission in starting the company was to bring more journalistic standards and journalistic rigor to the things we made. And mm -hmm. a lot of those uh, quite successful true crime podcasts are made in a very shoddy way. And they're, you know, they, don't, they don't even qualify as journalism. I mean, some, someone making them will essentially be like reading the Wikipedia page or just borrowing someone else's research without attribution and they're not fact checking and they're not thinking about the ethical considerations involved and what about the victims of those things. So there's all this stuff about it we didn't like. Um, but then we started to think, well, genre is really popular. Like you look at the chart, what's, what's a better way to do it? What's, a, you know, what's first of all, some, a journalistically responsible to a, a way to do it? But are there writers and people of the caliber we're interested in working with who do tell these kinds of stories? That is, you know, what's the, what's the in cold blood version? Who's the Truman Capote of, of true crime? And we've started working with a few different, we've now done a few different things. We've done a series called Lost Hills with a New Yorker writer named Dana Goodyear, who, you know, she's someone who's been compared to Joan Didion in terms of her literary voice, and also she writes about California. And she, we've now done two seasons of her show, which is about, basically about unsolved crimes in Malibu. But she approaches it with a sort of style and frame of mind that distinguishes it from all this other stuff. We also have a series called Deep Cover, which is another wonderful magazine writer named Jake Halperin. And we've just done a new season of that show called Never Seen Again, which is, on its surface, it's about two girls who disappeared, right? So it's the, it's the classic thing. But if you listen to it, I think you'll see all the ways in which this is different. And it's just an incredible story. I mean, these two, this one girl in South Carolina went missing, another girl in Seattle went missing, and the girl who went missing in South Carolina turned up seven years later as a student at Columbia. But it turned out it wasn't her, it was the girl who disappeared in Seattle using her identity. And then the story unfolds from there, and it's just, wow. it's just jaw dropping. And he, and he, in effect, solved it in that he figured out, you know. Well, don't tell us. We not, not, yeah, no, no spoilers. That, that's only that's all the first episode, right. so I'm not I'm not spoiling anything. But so when we work with Dana Goodyear or Jake Halpern, we have another um, uh, season of the first season we did of a show called Death of an Artist um, with a, an art historian named Helen Molesworth, which is about a famous. Uh, possible murder uh, uh, in the New York art world in the 1980s where the artist Carl Andre, who's still alive, was charged and tried for uh, murdering his, his wife, Anna Mendieta, who was also uh, a very important young artist, Cuban-American artist, who, as he said in the 911 call, went out the window of their apartment. Um, and this was revisiting this thing that had been hugely divisive, that had really been a rift in the, in the art world that in a lot of ways had not been addressed or healed since this happened in the late 80s. She went back, used the true crime story to sort of tell the, the arts, the cultural story. And so that's the kind of thing that we, we really like doing. We're not doing all true crime shows. Most of our shows aren't true crime shows. 
But um, you know, you can't fight City Hall. I mean, if this is what people want to listen to, I think part of our uh, approach to it is, well, let's give them a really good version of that. Got it. My, so I, I don't know how many podcasts or new ones are created every day or minute or year, but there seems to be a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, everybody, not everybody, but it, it, it strikes me that it's not expensive to make one, and I'm not suggesting that they're all up to the quality that Pushkin does, but they're, they're, it, it's, it's almost as many as new songs coming onto Spotify. Are things breaking through, or was there, you know, sort of a land grab five years ago, and the same big shows that were big five years ago are the same big shows today, or are things coming up over time? And if so, how do they sort of break through all of that? I, I think w more than you'd think, and probably more than desir is desirable. It's what you said that the things that started five years ago or more tend to still be pretty dominant. Um, there's always this funny fixation on the number of podcasts, and people say, oh, Spotify now has a million podcasts. It's like, how many books are in the library? You know, 99% of them are read by no one ever again. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of titles, and, and one of the things that's wonderful about podcasts is you can make one yourself with minimal expense and technology and experience. And if you're a young person, you can learn doing that. And that's a wonderful thing. But I would compare a lot of that more to uh, keeping a diary or, you know, or posting on social media or, or writing a, a blog. I mean, it's a kind of form of first personal expression, you know, a hobby, something you do for a small circle of people. Um, there's a much, much smaller number of podcasts that are really well-made, that are, that are properly staffed. Um, they don't all have to be as expensive as the ones we do. I mean, there, there are a lot of um, more amateur type podcasts that end up being really interesting and good. Uh, but when you look at what are the things that are most dominant, they are, for whatever reason, mostly shows either that come as legacy shows out of the world of public radio, This American Life, Radio Lab, things like that, um, or there are just things that got going when there was less competition. And huh. luckily, we hit the ground running when we started Pushkin. We'd already launched uh, Gladwell's show, Revision's History. That's now, we're now going to do the eighth season of that show, even. It'll, wow. it'll only be the fifth year of the company. And um, I, you know, I wish we could start new shows in the past because it was a lot easier. There was less competition of quality for people's attention. So if you started something that was good and well made, certainly 10 years ago, everybody interested in podcasts said, oh, there's a new podcast. Right. And now there are a lot of new podcasts and there are a lot of good new podcasts and it's, it's really, really hard to build audience now in the way we used to be able to. Huh. So I have a, a, a personal gr grief that I just want to ask a question about. So uh, when, when CDs first came out, I remember asking why, and we were all at the time, I think, listening to cassettes for the most part, just after, you know, LPs. And I would ask people, like, why are you buying CDs? And they would say, oh, the f sound fidelity is so incredible. And I'm looking at them saying, really? Like, you care what Black Sabbath, the fidelity <laughs> of the sound, or, or Rolling Stones, that's important to you? You know, and these were not people who were listening to classical music. So I'm, it's sort of the same thing that happens a little bit to me when I talk to people in the world of podcasting. They always talk about the quality of the audio, that it's important to have you know, really good sound. And I'm just curious whether that's because the people who get into podcasting have that bias or whether the audience really cares. It's a, it's a really good question. I do think there's a phenomenon um, which is not unique to podcasting, but call it the producers wanting to impress their fellow producers. But, you know, if you're, if you, when you're a writer, you also write for other writers. I mean, mm -hmm. you care about your, your, if you're a successful writer, you probably care a lot about your, your public. But at the same time, there's certain people who are your peers mm -hmm. who you really want to impress. And I think it's um, one of the things someone in my position can do that's, that's useful is to lead people a little bit away from that insularity. Mm -hmm. um, but um, there, you know, there are just some things you butt up against. I mean, I, I joked earlier about listening um, to podcasts on, you know, uh, advanced speed. Right. Right. I just do it because a lot of I listen to a lot of podcasts because I want the information, and I will listen to them pretty fast. And when producers 
find out I do that, they're really horrified because they're making these exquisitely crafted works of art and listening to them. I mean, you wouldn't listen to music on one and a half speed. You know, you wouldn't watch a movie on... You, you might know, listen to Philip Glass that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You're kind of saying, I'm a little bored by this. I get it. Could you move a little faster, please? Right. Um, but, um, but I think that thing of, of, of sort of... Um, Michael Lewis is a great kind of riff on this about, you know, always being really conscious of the fundamental need to keep your audience entertained and mm -hmm. engaged. And when you stop doing that, kind of God help you, you know, but there is just this sort of tendency to make things exquisite um, in a way that doesn't necessarily serve the listener. I'll give you another example. I mean, I think in, in my old world, the world of news, newspaper, newspaper journalism, it's a real affliction to do journalism for prizes as opposed to readers. Mm -hmm. So um, the, um, I, you used to say that the, the, the uh, most depressing uh, words in journalism were first of a series. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, what wins, what wins the Pulitzer Prize every year? It's, it's, the, you know, it's the thing that's in depth that the other, the journalists on the prize committees most admire because they see how much work it was, how hard it was, and then when you but you do that, you don't you're not necessarily serving the reader because you're not you're not boiling it down. You're making it long instead of short. Um, you're going into a lot of detail that may or may not really matter to the readers. Um, so I have a certain affinity for uh, British journalism. Let's say in um, in British newspapers by tradition, the articles don't jump. An article starts on the front page. You get the whole article on the front page on a broadsheet paper, um, including, you know, really the Telegraph, the Guardian, the Times of London. They might have another story on the same subject that picks up something else inside the paper. I always think that's the right way to do it. And when I read the New York Times, I mean, I don't, only on the weekend do I still read it in print. But there are six stories on the front page that jump to different places further into the paper. And it never made any sense to me that you would jump, you would toggle back and forth between the front page and inside the paper. And so many of those stories sort of conserve a kind of journalistic vanity hmm. as opposed to the purpose of, of serving the reader. Got it. Yeah. Um, last question, yeah. maybe. Before I'm sorry, this turned into you asking. No, me no, no, I'm I happy. I, I, don't, I, I have nothing. <laughs> so when I look more broadly at the media landscape, uh, music or film or television, very quickly also, th there's like an ecosystem that grew up in support of those mm. medium to help the audience understand what's good, what's bad. Some of it is bestseller lists, whether it be Billboard or the New York Times bestseller list. Some of it is box office results. There's a whole review mechanism that we would go to. You know, books, it was the New York Times book review. Music, it used to be Billboard, but Rolling Stone magazine. Why hasn't podcasting found its footing in that way? Why hasn't there gone, yeah, there's, you know, there's the, the, the Apple list, but that's not really, you know, broadly read. I'm curious why there isn't a bigger or, or a more robust ecosystem around podcasting in that way. It's a frustration of mine, and it's something I've thought about. It is, all of that infrastructure is woefully inadequate. I mean, sometimes people frame this as saying, there's no good discovery mechanism for podcasting. People who like podcasts, where do I go to find more podcasts I would like? There's no way, and you know, people sometimes use the Apple chart just as a kind of very crude proxy. What's popular on Apple? Because it's a place you can look and see what is a, sort of the closest thing to a bestseller list, but it's a, you know, and you can look at it by category. So it'll give you some idea if you like business podcasts. You know, what are some other bi business podcasts that are popular? Um, I think it starts with the underlying technology of podcasting, um, which is something called an RSS feed, and an RSS feed is very simple. It's the same way blogs were built. And it's essentially, you put your show out on a feed and anybody can build, sometimes called a podcatcher, to pick it, pick it up. So you can build yourself a podcast player and give people access to all of these podcasts that are created. And they come with the ads attached so you don't necessarily make any money doing that. But as a result, there are lots of different ways to consume podcasts. Mm -hmm. But because the RSS feed is this simple one-way distribution mechanism. There's very little that comes back in the other direction in terms of feedback. There's no mechanism in an RSS feed for comments, but there's also no mechanism for knowing who is on the other end. Hmm. We don't get any data about the listener. The only thing you get 
um, really is an IP address, which is essentially tells you where the phone or computer is geographically. Like an IP address would tell you that this building is listening to, to a podcast. So that's sort of good to know. We know that we're like, a lot of people, Tulane or New Orleans are listening. This show is really popular in New Orleans. We don't know anything about gender, age, all the stuff that um, marketers want and that creators want about who's listening. We don't get. So with that kind of data vacuum, um, it's very hard to kind of build out some of the other stuff. Now, in terms of the critical apparatus, I don't know why that's happened. I mean, you would think there would be a lot more reviewing of podcasts. They're really, really popular now. You know, more than half of the population in the United States um, describes themselves as podcast listeners, like listen to a podcast in the last week. People are listening to podcasts. Why aren't there people telling them what's really good? They're little bits, but it's more like a little coverage here and there. There's no, you know, there's no publication devoted to that. Yeah. Um, the way you got in the early days of radio or television, you know, guides to what to listen to, reviews of what's good. Um, I really like rooting for someone to create it. And honestly, if I didn't already have a podcast company, I would probably create one. That's the next thing on. Um, should we open yeah. everything up to questions? Absolutely. Yeah, and please um, step up to one of the. There's oh, a we microphone. can probably hear you. Yeah, or talk loudly and we'll repeat it. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, do you have any uh, e audiobooks on, in the works that you're working on? And have you read the Chris uh, Blackwell Islander book? Because it would be great for, the, for an e book. Um, thank, thank you for that great question and a chance to talk about my other passion, which is audiobooks. So, you know, uh, Malcolm and I sort of had the idea when we started the company that you, there's all these, this big audience for podcasting, but audiobooks were still made in this very s simple way, not drawing on any of the techniques that we as podcast producers use. So we started making audiobooks sort of more to a podcast standard, which of course is much more expensive, but using archival tape and l recorded interviews, and particularly for nonfiction books, I think it just makes so much more sense. You don't want to hear a narrator saying, quote, he said. You want to hear the voice of the person who's being quoted and hear you know, relevant bits of music and texture. So we do that, um, and I think it is coming, but it's been sort of slow because of the economics of the business. I did hear the Chris Blackwell thing, which I heard as a podcast, it originally ran as a podcast, I believe in the UK, and I don't know if they've offered it as, a, as an audiobook here, but yeah, it's a great story about it, how, how he founded Island Records and his, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well what's hard, what's hard about that it's, um, is, is music licensing. So it's very expensive, and beyond being expensive, it's really difficult to license music for either podcasts or audiobooks. And so that's why uh, you hear a lot of uh, both uh, podcasts and audiobooks about music that don't have as much music. We've tried to be an exception to that. We did a project called Miracle and Wonder with Paul Simon, and you hear lots of his music, and it cost us a lot of money to make it. <laughs> How did you get, how did we get stuck with the name podcast? I'm not sure. <laughs> Good question. Yes, um, we, we gave up some years ago on trying to change it, but um, yes, it's never been totally satisfactory. Um, it's because of the, um, it's because of Apple. And, you know, Apple has been, I think, a very, um, benign beneficiary in podcasting. Podcasts exist because they started uh, enabling them and put they put a, a podcast app in, I forget which early version of the iPhone. And that's really how, big part of how podcasts broke out. And also AirPods, their product have been, you know, huge advance for, for podcasts. Just that, you know, way they're inside your head just makes it so much easier and better, better to listen. And podcasts have never been a business for them. I mean, they've only supported them basically to help advance adoption of iPhones and AirPods and other products. But they created it so people, someone just started calling them podcasts, i.e. on your iPod. And um, we don't even have iPods anymore. But um, yeah, we're stuck with it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
I'm wondering what the difference is between writing for print and writing for a podcast, and how much the spoken is the emotion because it, there's a voice there that that's the impetus for what podcast listeners are listening for. Yeah, I mean, again, Julia Barton has, I've heard her give a full lecture on this subject. So, you know, um, just like touching, like tip of the iceberg as someone who's been involved in making a lot of podcasts, but I've only made a limited number myself. Different, definitely a different kind of writing. Um, shorter sentences. Um, it's a, in a way, um, audio, just, things just need to be simpler. Um, you really need, in almost all cases, to, to develop stories chronologically. If you jump around a lot, people get confused. Um, you need sort of more simple declarative statements. Things that are, might be really good writing in a novel or in a, in a literary, work of literary nonfiction get complicated and confusing. You know, you just, I, I think it's, it's something about the, 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 the uh, sort of atomic unit of the, of, uh, that's absorbed in terms of prose is different. And I think also, you know, certain kinds of like written humor don't translate. Um, and then I think texture and complexity work really well in audio. I mean, not complexity like a complicated chronology, but hearing samples of everything and using different elements and hearing a bit of tape from someone found in an archive with a piece of relevant music with a narrator, with an interview, and, go, and moving between those two, those different elements. Um, so the writing is, you know, it's much more the creation of a script and it's more polyphonic in the sense that there are these different elements coming in and out, as opposed to being the connected prose that an, a single author produces. It's much more collaborative. Hi, um, I'm a student here, and I'm really interested in like going into publishing for books or like editing for magazines, which like you guys seem to have a lot of experience in. So I kind of had like two part question. I was wondering like how did you guys get into that, and then also how did that background help you in the switch to like digital media. Michael, why don't you take a whack at that one? Um, well, I would start by saying I would encourage you to pursue the book path as opposed to the magazine path. I think magazines are one of the only formats which actually may just go away. Uh, books seem to have, you know, have survived through lots of these changes and will continue to survive and they will need editors Forever, for however there are books. I've, for the most part, always been on the business side of things. The way I started in, in, in the book business, winding up uh, eventually before I went to the movie business at Penguin, uh, running Penguin, was licensing coloring books. <laughs> it was that simple. I worked at the Walt Disney Company. I went to go work there, and they, there, was a, there was a part of the business that um, was sort of not being paid attention to, which was licensing coloring books, and I spent a lot of time in Racine, Wisconsin, where Western Publishing was at the time, licensed coloring books. That's not the trajectory I would offer. Uh, I think that's probably not what you're thinking about. Um, I think the, 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 the probable key to it is going to work for whether it be a literary agency or a publisher. It's, it's a very old-fashioned business in that respect. It's a business which, which is based on apprenticeship. So you, you, know, you wind up working for somebody as an assistant and you read a lot of manuscripts and you pick the good ones from the bad ones at the beginning. I mean, it's called the slush pile, at least that's what it used to be called. And you work your way up editing books over time. Magazines is a very different side of things. I, I was a little bit in the magazine business um, and Jacob could comment on that better than I could. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, a couple of things I'd say. I mean, first of all, I think, there is virtually no profession in which writing clearly and well is not a tremendous advantage. And I think there's going to be more and more of a premium on it. Um, there's a story in The New Yorker this week about the decline of the English major at universities like Tulane, you know, which is very, very sad to me, not just I wasn't an English major, I was a humanities major, but um, people don't see the immediate payoff to humanities majors in general, and I think that's show, so short-sighted um, because I think in almost any organization, the person who writes clearly 
has, a, has an advantage. And it's interesting, at Pushkin, not everyone is trained as a writer, but almost everybody we hire is a good, clear writer. And people write you know, without tremendous discomfort. They, they sit down and they write, they get their ideas across. And thank God for that. Um, I think in terms of magazines, Michael, to Michael's point, um, there's a lot of economic fragility around magazines, not as much as around you know, newspapers. I mean, newspapers don't even want to be called newspapers anymore, but say news organizations or you know, periodic publications, which might, or might, or might not have a print dimension. Um, I think you know, it's important now to understand something about the economics of any media business that you're going into. I think when I started out in the 80s, you didn't have to worry about that if you didn't want to. Want to. If you just wanted to be a writer or an editor, you could figure you're going to do your thing, and if you did it well, there would be jobs for you, and other people would worry about the business side. And in fact, the business sides were kept very separate by design. You know, there was a kind of church-state type policy where you didn't even want the the business people kind of knowing too much about what was happening on the editorial side of the publication. That's all gone. I mean, I think creating any kind of publication or sustaining any kind of publication, it extends to some extent to book publishing. Um, you have to be innovating and figuring out some way to make work something which is not fundamentally working in an industry-wide way. So even if you're not going to be a business person, I think you kind of got to know, you know you're, you're placing a bet on something that could make sense. One more question, yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, thank you, it's been great. I wanted to ask you, as both experienced journalists, have you, do you believe that there's been a huge rise in misinformation in, in journalism, or have we always had this for 200 years, but it just seems like there's more, for instance, a, misinformation gets more clicks, like it travels around the internet much faster than like a true story? I, so as the non-journalist, I'll give you a theory of the case, which is not my theory. It was done via the RAND Corporation, which is that every time there has been a major technological shift in news in particular, but media more generally, you find enormous disinformation. So it happened, for example, in the latter part of the 19th century with yellow journalism. You find it in the 20s with radio. Father Coughlin was, was the big perpetrator of it. You find it in television news, happened a lot of it in the 60s. And you're finding it now with the internet. And I think you were about to find it on steroids with chat, GBT, and large language artificial intelligence. Um, over time, it tends to even out, although we've never seen it at the scale that we've seen it before, and we've never seen it with advanced AI. So I think everybody better fasten their seatbelts, because we're in for a real ride. Well, slightly grim, I think that was a great last word. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.